is to explain where we're going and what the text is and then to break the text open and then to apply it and then to kind of conclude it. I want to do it differently. Today I want to take you on a journey with you. I want to invite you into the process from a question to an answer that I went through in preparing this message. I'll take you through step by step and ask you to imagine maybe you're sitting there asking the same question. You're looking to the scriptures the same way as I was to say, Lord, what is your word saying about this? And then how you work through that and at the end of it, you come to the answer and know what the Holy Spirit actually is saying and how he's answered your question. It started about early last week, I guess, with a picture I don't know how many of you folks saw this in the press or on the TV. Anybody see this thing? A oh, wine. Wow, okay. Well, they've just donated it, uh, donated. APSA have just donated that to the Genocide and Holocaust Museum here in South Africa. And its history is as follows. That typewriter was used by Adolf Hitler just before he rose to power. A friend of his either borrowed it or stole it or it was given to him, whatever, headed off for South Africa, wound up in this country, joined Volkskast Bank. Volkskast then became part of APSA later, and APSA have now put it on permanent loan with, with that museum. Now, I was looking at that, and the first thought that went through my mind was as follows. What terrible, wonderful irony, because the manufacturer is Underwood. Now, Mr. Underwood was a British citizen, who emigrated to the United States of America. And he went to New York and he set up a typewriter factory. His name was Underwood. And they produced the Underwood typewriter, that one. Here is Adolf Hitler typing on something that was actually produced by the very person, very group of people who were going to lay him down at the end of, the, of his batch of trying to find conquest. The, the second thing that occurred to me was, my goodness, I wonder what he used that typewriter for. He wasn't typing out party invitations on it, that's for sure. All right, now, he would have had that typewriter just after he had come out of prison. And we know that he started work on Mein Kampf, his book, Mein Kampf, The Struggle. He started that when he was in prison. So it's quite probable that he actually typed it up on that. It was, it was printed and, and, and published shortly after it. And I was thinking to myself, wow, maybe that instrument or what he used to put down this poisonous doctrine. And then I thought, and what were the effects of that? Oh, wow. Well, the effects of that ultimately it led to the slaughter, the Holocaust, the slaughter of millions of Jews and Christians. But its influence continues today. There are many, many circles of society around the world who still hold to the doctrines which he espoused in that book. The doctrines of race and the doctrines of domination and the doctrines of dominance over people and countries and nations. And then I thought the question, which is the one that I then started working through, and the question was, how did he get those thoughts? Where did those thoughts come from? Those thoughts which he then typed out, let's assume, he types them out into this document, which goes on out, which uh, pollutes a nation and a world. Where did the thoughts come from? What does the Bible have to say about that? Now, if you were doing a study on this, I guess to try and answer that question, you would maybe look up a concordance, or you would sort of go through your memory and say, well, what kind of Bible texts do I know that speak about how thoughts become realities? Now, something that starts in the mind like that can translate it until it is a reality which affects many, many people. And you might well wind up with Proverbs 23, verse 7. You'll recognize it, I'm sure, when I read it to you. In the, in New, English, uh, sorry, the New King James Version, it says this, For as he thinks in his head, so is he. Have you heard that before? In other words, if he thinks something, that something becomes his reality. <sighs> I, I hate to disillusion you, but it's a text taken totally out of its context and butchered beyond belief. 
Let me give you the actual full verse. Here's how Proverbs 23 actually reads. Don't eat a stingy person's bread, and don't desire his choice food, for as he thinks within himself, so he is. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. He's not talking about some kind of a magical process whereby thoughts materialize in reality. He's talking about a stingy, manipulative hypocrite and how he operates. Here we've taken this, ripped it out of its context, and used it to try and teach a doctrine. Well, I ain't going to do that today. So I looked further. And of course, the Bible is full of wonderful texts and wonderful teachings which explain to us how thoughts do influence what we say, and they do influence, obviously, what we do, and that they do have profound influences in the world around us. And the text that I landed on eventually was Ephesians 4, verses 17 to 24. Now, I just want to read it to you. We'll come back to it, and I'll show you how it relates to answering the question that I've posed. It reads as follows in the ESV. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, due to the hardness of their hearts. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. Okay, Paul gives us this principle here. Firstly, in the negative side, and secondly, in the positive side. First of all, he talks about, guys, you shouldn't be like the heathens. The pagans, the godless, he's referring to, he's saying, they walk, and he's talking about a lifestyle here, they're walking out their lives in darkness, and they're performing all these bizarre things which are negatively affecting their lives and their families and their nation and so on. Their lifestyle is darkened. And the cause of that dark lifestyle is because they are futile in their thinking, darkened in their understanding, and ignorant. They have an ungodly mindset, therefore they have an ungodly lifestyle. So the principle is quite clearly espoused here, as in many other portions of Scripture. Our mindsets, the sum total of what we think and how we reason things and how we speak, that affects our lifestyle and what we do and our lifestyle has some massive repercussions in our families, in our businesses, in our nation, in our world. And then in verses 20 to 22, he puts that same truth across from the positive side. He said, but you guys aren't like that, for you have the teaching and the truth and Jesus. Therefore, you have a renewed mindset. So therefore, take off your old one, toss it into the bin, and walk in this new life that you have. Walk it out. You have a new mindset. Therefore, live a reformed lifestyle. But you can't just stop there. If you were studying through this passage, you, I'm sure, would do what I did. You'd say, but hang on a second. I need to go a bit deeper here. Because what is it that actually forms this mindset? You know, how do I arrive at at the way of thinking. Why am I programmed a certain way? What is it that it gives rise to the way I think? Let me use a current example so that we can grapple with this particular issue. Gender-based violence is a scourge in our country right now. Correct? Around the world, but particularly here, it's a scourge. It's an abomination. So I ask the question, why do so many of our men think that it's okay to beat, abuse, and rape women? Why? Where on earth do they get that no notion from? Why do they think it's all right? 
Why do so many boy children in our schools beat up on and rape and murder their fellow classmates? Why? Why? Where would they get such a notion that that's an acceptable thing to do, or an allowable thing to do, let alone a desirable thing to do? Now, I know I'm going to oversimplify, and the, the sociologist and the psychologist here will start going tut tut at me. But I want to oversimplify for the sake of making the point. I think a large part of the problem is because they have learned this behavior from their adult figures, their male role models. They have grown up with a mindset which says, if it's okay for my dad to do it, and my uncle to do it, and my older brother to do it, it's okay. And those same adults have actually taught them it's okay, not only by what they, they do, but what they say, and how they treat their mothers, and how they treat other women in society around them. And this is reinforced by the traditions that they've grown up in, a tradition which denigrates the woman and elevates the man. And unfortunately, it's further reinforced by many women who hopelessly accept it and say, oh, well, it must be okay. Men will be men. Best I don't say anything. It'll just make it worse for me. Don't make the mistake of thinking that this is a, a tradition that has come down through only one part of our population. Totally on the opposite. It permeates Western society, and it permeates African society, and it permeates Eastern society as well. Let me give you some examples. The Victorian era of jolly old Great Britain is only just over three generations away. Do you know that? Queen Victoria and her merry men were fully operational just over three generations ago. It's about, yeah, if you, if you count 40 years as a generation, it's just over 120 years ago. In the Victorian era, what was the status of women, may I ask? In Britain and in South Africa, what was the status of women? Zero. No vote, no respect, no jobs, barefoot, pregnant, in the kitchen, serve the food and shut up. That's part of our Western tradition that's come through. What about the tradition on the other side of young ladies who get bartered for and married off for the benefit of the father? What's that saying about the young lady? What's it actually saying about her real value as a human being and as an equal, not as something to be looked down upon or to be traded with? What about the Eastern tradition, the horrific tradition, which, which is happening before our eyes in the world today? It's called honor killing where a young girl who is not, maybe or not of marriageable age, does something which is deemed to be inappropriate, just the smack of sexual infidelity of something of that nature, and the father goes and kills her. The father kills her. His daughter. Oh, where on earth does this mindset come from? Where does this notion come that this beautiful child that I brought into this world, that I raised, that is blood of my blood, bone of my bone, and fully equal in society, I can just take a knife and, and take her out? Where on earth does this come from? And again, in case we get too complacent on the Western side of things, what about dear old jolly Charles Darwin? A lot of Western science nowadays and tradition takes a lot of its, its basis from evolutionary theory of Charles Darwin. It's affected a lot of our lives. Do you know that Charles Darwin, in his Origin of Species, one of the things he wrote in there, was that, I won't, can't quote it exactly, but I'll give you the gist of it. It is quite clear from evolution that men are evolutionary superior, both in mind and physicality, to women. Huh? What planet was he living on? I ask you. Now let's bring it even closer home. What about wage inequality? 
Why is it that women on average earn 17% less than men in doing the same job? On average. And a lot, a lot less. What is the thought process which says she is doing the job I can do, maybe better, she has the same responsibility, the same influence in the company and in society, the same value to the co corporation, but I'll pay her less because she's woman. Please, would somebody explain it to me? I'm a man, I don't understand it. So how do you ladies grapple with that kind of thing? I don't know. But it's happening right now. And what about the objectification of women through pornography and through the media and through movies and through sex trafficking, etc.? What is that saying about the value of women? Look, if we're going to change a nation, we'll have to change the mindset of this nation to think differently, right? Because a transformed mindset will yield transformed and reformed lifestyles. But that's not an electric light bulb moment, you know. That's not an aha moment. We all know this. It's nothing new about that idea. And gosh, have not we been trying to do this now? As a people and in our companies and so on, we try to, to do some of this re-education. There's nothing new here. But why isn't it working, may I ask? It's going awful slow. All the education in the world doesn't seem to be shifting the basic issue here. There's something deeper that needs to change. So let's go down one more level in this text and see what that something deeper is. You'll find it in verse 23. This strangely constructed sentence which says, Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now, this is not Paul just phrasing something quaintly. The word spirit pneuma appears in the Greek of this text. He's talking about something not just intellectual. If you look it up in the authorities, um, Vincent, for instance, in his Word Testament study says, this word means the human spirit having its seat in and directing the mind. And the UBS New Testament handbook says, it's the part of a person that relates to God. Yeah, that's exactly right. Because at the heart of this issue is that there's something deeper than mind. There's the human spirit. And if that human spirit is not renewed and regenerated by the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus, the mind will not be transformed. No matter how much education we try and pour on it, no matter what laws and rules we try and prescribe behavior by. The mindset won't shift. If the mindset doesn't shift, the behavior doesn't change until the spirit is renewed. And this is what Paul's writing about here. Be transformed and be renewed in the spirit, which then controls your mind, which then changes your mindset, which then changes the behavior of yourself your family, your sons, your nation. This spirit is the very component part of the human being that was separated from God in the Garden of Eden. This is the part that died to God through sin and rebellion and idolatry. This is the part of the human being that every person who comes into this world and draws breath on this planet has got a spirit, but it's cut off from God. It lies dormant like a little weak balloon that hasn't been blown into yet. But when the Spirit of God comes and breathes life into the Spirit, in Jesus' name and through what He's done in the cross of Calvary, and as the person cries out and says, Lord, renew my spirit, then we come alive in Him. And we can communicate with them. Now our minds can be changed. Now as we study the scripture, we are transformed in the way we think. We are washed with the word of God and it changes us. And then renewed mindsets give rise to different actions. And our different actions can change this nation. And can change the world. Now this fundamentally important piece of information 
that it is the God-given, God-breathed, God-controlled part of the human being which is all important in making the change. This has been lost to the world and it's been covered up in most of the church. And let me explain what I mean by giving you two examples. Part of my past life, I have many lives. One is my current one, the other one is my past one. My past one, I was a banker. Oh, shame, says everybody. <laughs> and at one stage of my career, I was in charge of the training division of the bank. And I took upon a, a personal responsibility of personally training the management team throughout the branch network. So we would bring up these managers. Um, I think we had probably had about maybe 500 of them. We'd bring them up in, in batches. And we would take them to the executive training center in Santon. And there they would get subjected to a week's long training on how to think differently and how to be leaders and how to be good managers and so on. Now, in this one particular course that I was running, I'd invited a psychologist to come along. And he was one of those, get up and go. If you, if you set your mind to it, you can do it. Roy, you can do it. You know, you know those ones? And he was really good and really funny, and he had the people really going. But I'm a Christian. And I wanted to make sure this group understood that there was more than this. But I also knew that I could not take this platform to give them a sermon. This was not the right thing to do. That would be an abuse of my position. So I compromised. I, I, after he had finished, I said, thank you so much. Guys, that was really fantastic. But let me just show you a chart. Yes, there's something different. And I sketched them a little thing about how there's the spirit of the human being needs to come alive and how that will change the thing. Oh, this one guy kind of took such offense. Why are you bringing your Christianity into this? Man is just a body and a mind. And we've had all this lovely input on the mind. Now, why are you doing this? And I had to kind of back off and say, look, I'm telling you this is the truth. And if you want to sit over lunch with me, I'll take you further. But he was just echoing the mindset of the world. The mindset of the world says there is no spiritual condition. There's just a mind and a body. And the body generates the mind, and the mind is programmed by the things around you, and that's it. But tragically, it's also the church, a part of the church, a large part of the church. That's hidden this. Example. I was doing PhD studies, and my um, mentor and supervisor was the late Dr. Rex Matthew. Some of you will remember Rex Matthew, a wonderful Christian, good theologian. His job was to go through all the stuff I was producing and market and take me through it and help me to develop it and so on before it went out to the external examiners. And we got to the part of my work where I was dealing with this thing, this constituent parts of man, how we are actually not just minds and bodies, we actually are spiritual beings. And he says, Chris, now look, take my advice here, boy. Take that out of your thesis, because if you put that bit in there, the external examiners are going to have you for breakfast. Because this is not what the theologians, the top theologians around the world who will be mocking your stuff, this is not what they believe. I remember having to say to him, Rex, I respect you so much, but no, I won't do that. Let them mock me down if they will, but it's truth, and it must stand. I have no idea what the two ex externals thought of that lot, but I got through, which is all I cared about at that moment. But it was a lesson for me. It was saying it's not just the world, sunshine. A large part of the intellectual church, at least, is saying the same thing. There's just mind and there's body. Change what you do. Think different. Praise God. We never will change what we do. We never will change the way we think unless we come alive spiritually in Jesus' name. Now, I don't understand again, there are many things I don't understand. This is the third one for this morning I don't understand. I don't understand how Christians who believe the Bible can come to that kind of conclusion. I mean, listen to Paul in just three texts. I'll just read three of them of the, of the many. How he differentiates between the soul, as he calls it, the mind, and the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 14, verses 14 to 15. Paul writes, For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my mind. I will sing with my spirit, 
but I will also sing with my mind. How can you avoid the, the obvious that he's making a comparison between the two? They're not the same. Hebrews 2.12, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was because of texts like this that I refused to take it out of my thesis. This is true. So if we want to change the lifestyles of our nation, we need to change the mindset. But we have to do more. We must facilitate the change in the spiritual condition of our people. That's the fundamental missing bit. For that to happen, God must do something. We can only facilitate it. We cannot breathe our life into a man or a woman and they come alive. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. But we can facilitate it. And we should facilitate it. A critical mass in this country needs to be spiritually born again. A critical mass means enough to change the whole. Enough of a part to change the whole. If the critical mass in this nation becomes born again of the Spirit of God, then the mindset of our nation can shift. And it can shift rapidly. And then the lifestyles of our nation can change. So this is why witnessing, evangelism, and disciple-making really should be a high priority for us at this time. You know, we all want a transformed nation. Those of us who are still here and haven't got our tickets to Perth, <laughs> or Sydney, or other very hot, fiery places. If, if we're living here, is this not right up here on the top of our minds? Well then, surely making disciples must be a high priority for us. And this is why we need real Holy Spirit, Bible-based, Jesus-centered revival in this day. We need God to come with such power that He'll shake us up, not the world, not the nation, us, His church. Shake us up, breathe new life into us, that we will become renewed in the spirit of our minds. And we'll rise up like a people of God at last and go out into this world, not to Bible bash and to lecture, but to share Jesus and his life and the reality of what it is to be changed in his name. To make disciples is a command of God. It's the great command and the great commission. Go into all the world. As you heard last week, it's also the get out of jail from hell. <laughs> if we care for people, we'd want to share the gospel so they don't wind up in the really hot place. But it's even more than that. Those are true and those are valid, but it's more. It's a national transformation imperative for us to share the gospel. Now, hopefully, as you folk have been listening to my little journey with you, in, from a thought, a question, to the text, hopefully you've been saying to yourself, but Chris, that text doesn't speak about evangelism, does it? Oh, it's true, it doesn't. I would be very remiss if I then said to you, now look, this text is just about evangelism. Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is not talking Ephesians chapter 4 about evangelism. National transformation or not, the principles I've exposed you are in there and they're valid and they're true. But he is writing to a church and he's saying, you guys, Stop living like the Gentiles, for you have been renewed by the Spirit. Your minds must be transformed. Live in holiness and purity. Let your words and your example and your lifestyle shine. He's talking to us. So the thing that lies even deeper in this text 
is that the key to all of this starts with you and me. We must be renewed in the thinking of our minds. That means that for me, I guess my takeaway is my highest priority at this time should be to build such a strong relationship with Jesus through His Word, through His Spirit. I need to give priority time to that. I need to make sure that no matter what the busyness is around me and all the demands in my life, I must make sure that I spend quality time. You know, QT doesn't just mean quiet time. It means quality time with Jesus and His Word. Seek His Word. Understand it. Apply it. Cry out on a daily basis, Oh Lord, fill me again with your Spirit. Let my thinking be different. Let me see people differently. Let me look with different eyes into the ladies of my nation if my mind has been polluted in this area. Help me, Lord. Renew me. I need to seek His face as a high, high priority. Your and my spiritual renewal will yield a changed mindset. And that we can offer to this country. Do you realize that there is only one group of people who can offer that to our nation? And it's not the politicians. And it's not the theologians. It's you. We, the church, the Christians, are the only ones who can go into this world, into this nation, and share Jesus and the reality of who He is and what it is to be born again of His Spirit and how to receive that and how to live that out and how to form a church and be part of His, his wonderful burgeoning community of saints. Only we have got that to offer. Only the Holy Spirit can do it, but only we can offer it among all the people in this nation. So we need to take very, very seriously the way Paul starts this passage. He says this, I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord. Let me paraphrase lastly. Paul says to them and to us, listen up, kids. I am not just saying this. I'm insisting on this in the name of Jesus. This is important. Stop living as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. But be transformed by the renewing of the spirit of your mind into the likeness and image of Jesus so that you can shine as Christians in this dark world. I want to ask you to take just three minutes. I'm going to play a song that I'm pretty sure you've not heard before because it was composed by the wife of a dear friend of mine and she only cut a CD with it as the lead song recently. And so I doubt if too many people have been exposed to it, which enables you to just sit quietly and just listen to the words and take the next three minutes to internalize what I've been saying. I've taken you hopefully through this journey. Maybe you can relate to it. And maybe you can start to say, okay, Lord, where to from now? You and me, Lord. How are we going to build this relationship so I can be part of the transformation of a nation? Listen quietly and then Carlos will take us further.